let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. It's uh, from a book I just finished. <coughs> uh, and the book is called Before the Law, um, Humans and Other Animals in a Biopolitical Frame. And uh, it's, it's completely the opposite of what is posthumanism, which is really, as you could probably tell, like a lot of books these days, um, a collection of essays disguised as a book, essentially. But this, this book that I just finished is really a, uh, it's really a 42,000 word essay, essentially. So it's a completely different kind of beast, I guess you would say, and a uh, different kind of writing challenge. Um, but what I try to do in this book, it originated from an essay I wrote for, uh, that was asked to write for a Law and Humanities journal. And what I'm trying to do in this book is sort of bring uh, two, I think, important uh, emergent fields, or, or I wouldn't call them fields, but um, obsessions, preoccupations that people have right now in our line of work into conversation with each other. A animal studies, so, and these are all in heavy scare quotes, of course. Animal studies on the one hand and biopolitical thought on the other hand. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this is that these have been, I think, two largely non-intersecting um, intellectual genealogies, at least up to now. There are a few exceptions, but, but not many. So, so animal studies is or has been informed uh, primarily by um, really work coming out of the liberal justice tradition in ethics, so the conspicuous examples would be people like Peter Singer and uh, Tom Reagan and other people who were influential on, on founding the animal rights movement. And it's been largely in the register of ethics and not politics. And it's also, I think, largely been, although not exclusively been, uh, a North American phenomenon, although, as you all know, it originated um, in the UK, if you want to think about it historically. So there's, there, there's, there's sort of that intellectual genealogy over here. And then biopolitical thought, it seems to me, is, is you know, a different kind of formation. Um, right now, it involves very centrally a lot of people working in Italian political philosophy. Um, but it's largely you know, a, a, a oriented toward politics, and it's largely a European phenomenon. And so these have, these have really not been in much of a conversation with each other. And so what I want to do, do in this project is to essentially say, look, is biopolitical thought useful for thinking about not just the, the ethical questions that obtain to the human-animal um, difference and similarity, but also to thinking about those questions politically? I mean, is, is there a way that biopolitical thought can, can open up the, the political status of things, for example, like factory farming, in a way that have largely been limited to a kind of ethical objection so far um, in animal studies. So, <laughs> so that's what the book is about. And I actually start the book with sort of two main examples. One is a resolution you all may know about uh, that was presented to the Spanish Parliament, and it's also been presented to the United States Congress to grant um, essentially basic human rights on a, on a very classical model to great apes, right? And there's a book called The Great Ape Project that Peter Singer and the Italian philosopher Paolo Cavalieri co-edited that basically lays out the philosophical framework um, for um, rights for great apes. And so I start with that example on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the example that 10 billion with a B animals are killed per year in North America, <clears throat> almost all of them in conditions of factory farming for food. So what does it mean, and can biopolitical thought shed some light on this phenomenon where at one and the same moment we're taking steps to grant kind of unprecedented legal standing to some non-human beings even as we're also at the same time in a, in a really brutal and mechanized way engaged in this, the, this scale of industrialized killing of animals as never before in history. What does this mean that these are going on at the same time? <clears throat> and can biopolitical thought help us shed some light on that? So that's, that's the gambit with which I began the book. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, kind of a cartoon version of some of the ar uh, arguments in the book centered uh, on the question of neo-vitalism and specifically kind of a dialogue that I'm having throughout the book with the Italian political philosopher Roberto Esposito, whose book Bios, as you may know, um, I'm proud to say, appears in the post-humanity series <coughs> at Minnesota. So that's what we're doing. As any, numbers of, as any number of commentators have observed, the general drift of contemporary thought on the biopolitical has been overwhelmingly thanatopolitical. <coughs> 
that is oriented toward the domination of life and the increasing power over the life-death interval at a capillary level heretofore unknown. As is well known, Michel Foucault argues in the history of sexuality that, quote, for millennia, man remained what he was for Aristotle, a living animal with an additional capacity for a political existence. Modern man is an animal whose politics places his existence as a living being in question, unquote. Moreover, as Foucault famously defines biopolitics, it is, quote, the power to make live. Sovereignty took life and let live, and now we have the emergence of a power that I would call the power of regularization, and it, in contrast, consists in making live and letting die, unquote. In the three-volume sequence of which Bios is the third installment, Italian political philosopher Roberto Esposito sets himself two main tasks, trying to understand the extent to which biopolitics is a specifically modern phenomenon and exploring the extent to which biopolitics is necessarily thanatopolitical, with the eventual aim, as he puts it, of framing an affirmative biopolitics that runs counter, most conspicuously, of course, to the work of Giorgio Agamben. The possibility of an affirmative biopolitics hinges for Esposito on a reconceptualization of the subject of politics, and I mean that in both senses, one that can be traced to Foucault's later work. As we all know, Foucault argues in Society Must Be Defended that, quote, an important phenomenon occurred in the 17th and 18th centuries, the appearance, one should say, the invention of a new mechanism of power which had very specific procedures, completely new instruments, and very different equipment. It was, I believe, absolutely incompatible with relations of sovereignty. This new mechanism of power applies primarily to bodies and what they do, rather than to the land and what it produces. It was a type of power that presupposed a closely, a closely meshed grid of material coercions rather than the physical existence of a sovereign." Unquote. Most importantly for our purposes, he argues that this shift from sovereignty to biopower involves a new concept of the subject, one who is endowed with fundamental interests that cannot be limited to or contained by the simple legal category of subjectivity. In other words, the subject addressed by biopower comprises a new political resource, but one that, to be exploited, involves a new kind of trade-off as well. The biosubject, you might say, is far more full and robust than the thin subject of laws and rights, and it's here, as you may know, that Cora Diamond argues, following Simone Weil, that we may locate the origins of a concept of justice that's not just different from, but actually fundamentally opposed to, the concept of rights." Unquote. <coughs> Foucault allows us to see, as Esposito puts it, that for biopolitics, quote, what's in question is no longer the distribution of power or its subordination to the law, nor the kind of regime, nor the consensus that is obtained, but something that precedes it because it pertains to its primary material. Foucault thus discloses a key element of the contemporary political landscape, what Esposito calls the radical transformation of the idea of humanitas that escapes the very political and legal concepts inherited from modernity. Quoting Esposito now, presumed for centuries as what places human beings above the simple common life of other living species and therefore charged with a political value, humanitas increasingly comes to adhere to its own biological material, unquote. What's involved here is not so much the animalization of human populations, but rather the exposure of how that designation simultaneously masks and makes possible the more fundamental operations of modern politics by means of what Agamben calls, quote, the anthropological machine, which each time decides upon and recomposes the conflict between man and animal, unquote. A machine that depends upon, as you all know, uh, the distinction that Agamben borrows from Aristotle between bios, <coughs> or political form of life, and zoe, usually translated as bare life. At this juncture, however, it's worth emphasizing an important difference between Agamben and Foucault, and this is something I try to do in the book, is really drive a wedge, in a way, between not just Agamben and Foucault's reading of biopolitics, but what the stakes are, especially for non-human animals, and the difference between how they understand biopolitics. While it's no doubt true, both in Foucault's own discourse and in point of fact, that sovereignty continues to be an important force in modern politics, Foucault's point is that it becomes re recontextualized and finally subordinated to a fundamental political shift, 
And whereas Foucault allows us to disarticulate sovereignty from modern biopower, Agamben, as Jacques Ranciere rather elegantly puts it, quote, matches them by equating, by equating Foucault's control over life with Carl Schmitt's state of exception, unquote. As a number of critics have observed, therefore, Agamben's approach, quoting now, is ultimately too schematic as when it asserts an absolute symmetry between the figure of the sovereign and the abandoned object that is homo sacer. Quoting Agamben now, at the, at, the, at the two extreme limits of the order, the sovereign and homo sacer present symmetrical figures and have the same structure and are correlative. The sovereign is the one with respect to whom all men are potentially hominis sacri, and homo sacer is the one with respect to whom all men act as sovereigns, unquote. Or to put it slightly otherwise, the figure of bare life is included as excluded, inscribed within the law as abandoned by it. And it's in this paradoxical position that, that he's the counterpart to the sovereign himself, for he too is both inside and outside the political legal sphere. <coughs> Having thus pried apart Agamben and Foucault, we're thus in a better position to emphasize two further dimensions of Foucault's thinking of the biopolitical one positive or affirmative, and one negative, or at the very least, equivocal. The first derives from Foucault's rethinking of the political subject, as we've already noted, as one who is before the law, you might say underneath the law, or antecedent to the juridico-political order. What Maurizio Lazzarato calls Foucault's radical displacement of the problem of sovereignty, quote, does not neglect the analysis of sovereignty, but merely points out that the grounding force will not be found on the side of power since power is blind and weak, as Foucault puts it. Hence, its growing need in an increasingly complex and differentiated field of effectivity for the various techniques of management, surveillance, and so on that it deploys. What we're dealing with here is not, as Esposito puts it, quote, some kind of withdrawal or contraction of the field that's subjected to law, unquote, but rather how the law for its force gradually shifts from the transcendental level of codes and sanctions that essentially have to do with subjects of will to the eminent level of rules and norms that are addressed instead to bodies, unquote. <clears throat> and the term bodies here, I think, needs to be understood in the broadest possible sense as, as, as biological, zoological, as animal body. As Lacerato argues, three important points follow from this. Quote, biopolitics is the form of government taken by a new dynamic of forces that, in conjunction, express power relations that the classical world could not have known. Second, the fundamental political problem of modernity is not that of a single source of sovereign power, but that of a multitude of forces. If power, in keeping with this description, is constituted from below, then we need an ascending analysis of the constitution of power dispositifs or apparatuses. And third, biopower coordinates and targets a power that does not properly belong to it, that comes from the outside. Biopower is always born of something other than itself, unquote. <clears throat> Here then, with Foucault's emphasis on bodies before and outside the law, we find a potentially creative or aleatory element, to use Foucault's term, that inheres in the very gambit of biopower, an element that's not wholly subject to the thanatological drift of a biopolitics subordinated to the paradigm of sovereignty, as it is in Agamben. In Foucault's words, quote, where there is power, there is resistance, and yet, or rather consequently, this resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power, unquote. Indeed, the political payoff of Foucault's analysis of the mechanisms of disciplinarity, governmentality, and so on, resides in no small part in their anatomy of how the machinery of power constantly races to maintain control over the new forces that it has brought into its orbit, forces that derive <coughs> in no small part from animal bodies, human and non-human, that are not always already abjected, as they are in Agamben. Quite the contrary, those bodies are enfolded via biopower in struggle and resistance. And because those forces of resistance are thereby produced in very specifically articulated forms through particular dispositifs, there's a chance, and this in no small part marks Foucault's debt to Nietzsche, as Esposito points out, for life to burst through power of systematic operations in ways that are more and more difficult to anticipate. Thus, as Lazzarato notes, quote, Foucault interprets the introduction of life into history constructively, 
because it presents the opportunity to propose a new ontology, one that begins with the body and its potential <coughs> that regards the potential that the political subject as an ethical one against the prevailing tradition of Western thought, which understands it as a subject of law, unquote. Quoting again, without the introduction of the freedom and the resistance of forces, the dispositifs of modern, of modern power remain incomprehensible, unquote. This compels us then to firmly distinguish between biopolitics and its declension towards sovereignty as constitutive and biopolitics as a relation of bodies, forces, technologies, and dispositifs, which by definition could, could entail no such formal symmetry between sovereignty and bare life of the sort that we find in Agamben. As Lacerato puts it, quote, the fundamental problem of modernity is not that of a single source of power, but a multitude of forces that act and react amongst each other according to relations of command and obedience. This recontextualization of political subjectivity, if we want to continue to put it that way, <coughs> is in no small part what motivates a shift in Foucault's thinking in the 1970s when he moves from theorizing power on the model of warfare to instead asking, in Lazzarato's words, quote, how are we to liberate this new conception of power, one based upon the potential difference in autonomy of forces from the model of universal domination, unquote. It's here, as Deleuze realizes in his study of Foucault, that, quote, the passage into ethics is an internal necessity of the Foucauldian analysis of power, unquote. And it's also here that the last and definitive theory of power in Foucault, as Lazzarato puts it, requires a deconstruction of the subject of politics, power, and freedom. But, and you knew there was a but coming here, but as Esposito observes, and this is the negative or at best equivocal aspect of Foucault's analysis I mentioned a moment ago, <coughs> all of this leaves us, as he puts it, with a decisive question. If life is stronger than the power that besieges it, if its resistance doesn't allow it to bow to the pressure of power, then how do we account for the outcome obtained in modernity of the mass production of death, unquote. In short, why does biopolitics continually threaten to be reversed into thanatopolitics? Assuming a proximity to Agamben that's greater than, than Lazzarato would allow, Esposito observes that Foucault leaves hanging, quote, the question of the relation of modernity with its pre, but also with its post. What was 20th century totalitarianism with respect to the society that preceded it? Was it a limit, a tear, a surplus in which the mechanism of biopower broke free, or on the contrary, was it society's sole and natural outcome, unquote? Are the Nazi death camps, to use Agamben's words, quote, not a historical fact and an anomaly belonging to the past, but rather the hidden matrix and nomos of the political space in which we are still living, unquote? It's this impasse, as Sposito argues, that Foucault never really overcomes because he does not fully develop the immunitary logic of the biopolitical that he identifies in his later work, a paradigm also explored in this connection, as you all may know, by Donna Haraway, Jacques Derrida, and Nicholas Luhmann, among others. <coughs> Foucault recognizes in his lectures from 1976 that, quote, the very fact that you let more die will allow you to live more, Unquote. But he's unable to see the affirmative and thanatological dimensions of biopolitics, either a politics of life or a politics over life, as Esposito puts it, as joined in a single immunitary mechanism. Quoting Esposito now, rather than being superimposed or juxtaposed in an external form that subjects one to the domination of the other, in the immunitary paradigm, bios and nomos, life and politics, emerge as the two constitutive elements <clears throat> of a single indivisible whole that assumes meaning from their interrelation. From this perspective, he continues, we can say that immunization is the negative of the protection of life. It saves, ensures, and preserves the organism, either individual or collective, to which it pertains, but it does not do so directly, immediately, or frontally. On the contrary, it subjects the organism to a condition that simultaneously negates or reduces its power to expand." Unquote. The immunitary mechanism of biopolitics has, of course, tended overwhelmingly toward the thanatopolitical, toward the autoimmune disorder that Derrida analyzes in his later work, Philosophy in a Time of Terror, among others, by marking that which falls outside of and threatens the community or the subject of bios as pathogenic or objected, 
And it's here that the central function of race in modern biopolitics may be disclosed. As is well known, Foucault explores this topic in the lectures from 1975 and 6, Collected in Society Must Be Defended. Quoting Foucault now, in a normalizing society, race or racism is the precondition that makes killing acceptable, unquote. <clears throat> and it has a second immunitary function, he argues, quoting again, the death of the bad race of the inferior race or the degenerate or the abnormal is something that will make life in general healthier, healthier and purer, unquote. Esposito's immunitary paradigm seizes upon and develops this realization by Foucault, but with the added benefit of articulating how the distinction between bios and zoe is not simply a matter of deploying what looks at first glance like the isomorphic distinction between human and animal. In his bracing analysis of Nazi genocide, Esposito observes, and I'm quoting him now, more than bestializing man, as is commonly thought, Nazism anthropologized the animal, enlarging the definition of anthropos to the point where it also comprised animals of inferior species. He who was the object of persecution and extreme violence wasn't simply an animal, which was indeed respected and protected as such by one of the most advanced pieces of legislation in the entire world, but was rather an animal-man. The regime promulgated a circular that prohibited any kind of cruelty to animals, <coughs> in particular with reference to cold, heat, and the inoculation against pathogenic germs. Considering the zeal with, with which the Nazis respected their own laws, this means that if those interned in the extermination camps had been considered to be only animals, they would have been saved." Unquote. Now, while Esposito overstates his case here, as Singer, among others, has pointed out, the Nazis routinely conducted painful and brutal, brutal experiments on animals such as primates, his analysis does have the virtue of complicating our understanding of the relationship between the human-slash-animal distinction over here and the bios-slash-zoe distinction of biopolitics over here. And it also makes it clear that within the logic of the biopolitical, it's impossible to talk about the political without talking about race, and it's impossible to talk about race without talking about species. To put it another way, racial marking becomes the means by which the subject is deemed not automatically animal, but rather much more specifically killable but not murderable, a condition that nonetheless overlaps, of course, most completely historically with the designation animal. <coughs> this new differentiation of the biopolitical field is what Esposito is after at the end of BIOS, where he insists that a turn away from the thanatological and autoimmunitary logic of biopolitics and toward an affirmative biopolitics biopolit bio can only take place if life as such, not just human versus animal life, not just Aryan versus Jewish life, not just Christian versus Islamic life, becomes the subject of immunitary protection. Esposito writes, quote, we can say that the subject, be it a subject of knowledge, will, or action, as modern philosophy commonly understands it, <coughs> is never separated from the living roots from which it originates in the form of a splitting between the somatic and psychic levels in which the first is never decided in favor of the second. This means that between man and animal, but also in a sense between the animal and the vegetal and the vegetal and the natural object, the transition is rather more fluid than one had imagined." Unquote. And what this means, in turn, quoting again, is that there's a modality of bios that cannot be inscribed within the borders of the conscious subject, and therefore is not attributable to the form of the individual or of the person." <coughs> Unquote. To put it another way, if Agamben's contribution is to articulate powerfully how the anthropological machine cannot function without producing this remainder called animal, which is at the same time the retroactively posited origin that must be excluded by the political project of man, then Esposito's advance is not just to recognize the centrality of race in biopolitics, but to strike a powerful blow against it by suggesting that the animal is not something that need always already be objected. But an equally, equally powerful lesson of biopolitical thought, and we've already seen this in Derrida's critique of what he calls the animal, is that race and species must, <coughs> excuse me, in turn, give way to their own deconstruction in favor of a more highly differentiated thinking of life 
as the subject slash object of power if the immunitary is not to turn into the autoimmunitary more or less automatically, as Derrida warns in philosophy in a time of terror. Or in Esposito's words, quote, the most complete normative model is indeed what already prefigures the movement of its own deconstruction in favor of another that follows from it, unquote. And this is so, he argues, following Simondon, because, quoting again, there's never a moment in which the individual can be enclosed in himself or be blocked as a closed system and so removed from the movement that binds him to his biological matrix, unquote. And this leads, in turn, to Esposito's retrofitting of Spinoza's concept of natural right to make, quote, the norm the principle of unlimited equivalence for every single form of life, unquote. The general idea here is that this new norm will operate as a sort of homeostatic mechanism balancing the creative flourishing of various life forms. And as Esposito characterizes it, quote, <coughs> the juridical order as a whole is the product of this plurality of norms and the provisional result of their mutual equilibrium. It's for this reason that neither a fundamental norm from which all the other norms would derive as consequence can exist, nor a normative criterion upon which exclusionary measures vis-a-vis -vis those deemed abnormal could be stabilized, unquote. But here comes another but. <clears throat> but there are at least a few fundamental problems here. <clears throat> First, as Eugene Thacker has pointed out in his excellent book, After Life, if all forms of life are taken to be equal, then it can only be because they, as the living, all equally embody and express a positive sub substantive principle of life not contained in any one of them. Quoting Eugene now, the problem is that once one considers something like life in itself, whether in the form of a life principle or an inaccessible first principle, <coughs> then one must also effectively dissociate life from the living, unquote. Second, against this backdrop, one might well wonder about dangers of this attraction toward life and not just in U.S. political culture with this endless warring between pro-choice and pro-life factions, for example. We could sharpen the political point of the question by contextualizing it <coughs> in terms of the quite different role imagined by Derrida, for example, for Europe and European intellectuals, namely what he calls a cosmopolitanism counterpoised against the warring religious fundamentalisms of the Bush-era United States on the one hand, and its enemy of militant Islam, a role that might point toward what he calls the possibility of another discourse and another politics, a way out of this double theological political program, unquote. More specifically, <clears throat> and this has come up actually in some of the criticism with, a, with Agamben and Esposito, more specifically, is it possible, as a few people have noted, that a certain Christian or perhaps even Catholic thematics continues to play itself out here? Third, pragmatically speaking, Esposito's position fares no better, I'm afraid. For one thing, <coughs> it replays all the quandaries around biocentrism brought to light in the 1970s and the 1980s in North America during the heyday of the so-called deep ecology movement. Debates that Esposito, or for that matter, his fellow Italian political philosophers, would have little reason perhaps to know about. As Tim Luke notes, quote, <coughs> no, not quoting yet, sorry, if all forms of life are given equal value, and if no form of life can be favored over another with regard to ethical and legal norms, then we face questions such as the following. Will we allow anthrax or cholera microbes to attain self-realization in wiping out uh, sheep herds or human kindergartens? Will we continue to deny salmonella or botulism microorganisms their equal rights when we process the dead carcasses of animals and the plants we eat. <coughs> now, there are those, perhaps, who would respond to Luke's foregoing questions in the affirmative. And in fact, there were, during the heyday of deep ecology, who would argue that, yes, all forms of life should be equally allowed to take their course, even if it means a massive die-off of the species of Homo sapiens at, at say, like about a 70% rate. But biopolitically speaking, even if that's the case, it hardly solves the problem or even achieves the stated aim, because when we ask about the demographic distribution of such an event, <coughs> we realize that the, that the brunt of it would be absorbed by largely black and brown populations of the Southern Hemisphere, while those in what Richard Rorty calls the rich North Atlantic democracies who could afford to protect themselves would surely do so. 
Moreover, <coughs> the problem with equating the norm of the principle of unlimited equivalence of life, pure and simple, is made even clearer by prominent developments in contemporary biology, such as in vitro meat or synthetic meat in synthetic biology. I mean, after all, is in vitro meat real meat? Is it life? And doesn't synthetic biology only underscore what was always already true about life to begin with, <coughs> as with Marx's famous cherry tree? Precisely here, it seems to me, it's useful to remember Derrida's discussion of cloning and rogues. As he summarizes it, those who oppose cloning object to it in the name of ethics, human rights, what's proper to humanity, the dignity of human life, in the name of the singularity and non-repetitive unicity of the human person. One objects in the name of that incalculable element that must be left to birth, to the coming to, to light of the world of a unique, irreplaceable, free, and thus non-programmable living being. But what's overlooked here, as he puts it, <coughs> quoting again, is that so-called identificatory repetition, the duplication that one claims to reject with horrified indignation, is already and fortunately present and at work everywhere it's a question of reproduction and heritage in culture, knowledge, language, education, and so on, whose very conditions, whose production and reproduction are assured by this duplication. What is the consequence of all this? That in the end, the so-called ethical or humanist axiomatic actually shares with the axiomatic it claims to oppose a certain geneticism or biologism, indeed a deep zoologism, a fundamental but unacknowledged reductionism, unquote. Derrida's commentary here in the example of synthetic biology in general enables us to see how the biopolitical frame makes possible the thinking of a more nuanced and differentiated set of ethical and political relations with regard to forms of life, but only if we do not succumb to the sort of neo-vitalism that, at the end of Bios, seems to leave us with a stark choice, either life as unique, irreplaceable, free, and thus non-programmable, and the biocentrism that results from it on the one hand, or the autoimmune disorder, which, Esposito argues, is bound to eventuate if the continuum of life is broken, on the other hand. <coughs> As Claire Colebrook observes, of contemporary forms of thought that seem, but only seem, to be post or anti-humanist in their recourse to life, quoting her now, in place of man as a body with the additional capacity for reason, one distributes reason or thinking throughout life. However anti-humanist such a thesis might appear to be in its distribution of thought beyond the mind of the human organism and beyond organisms in general, as in, for example, some versions of the Gaia hypothesis, it is possible to see such a dethroning of humanity as making way for the creation of man. Man is now one aspect of a mindful, creative, self-organizing life, no longer detached from the world as some distinct substance or ghost in the machine, for life is now the milieu from which he emerges and through which he can read the enigmatic density of his own being." Unquote. Now, <coughs> Kohlberg's diagnosis is certainly right as far as it goes, I think, but what needs to be added here is Derrida's reminder throughout his work that no such reading is ever available to man. No such auto is available to the autobiographical animal, as he puts it. Moreover, and this is the truly radical insight of his later work, but it stretches back, I think, to his early work, that fact that I just noted actually binds human to non-human animals in their shared subjection to a technicity or machinalité of even the most rudimentary semiotic system on the basis of which, and only on the basis of which, living beings can engage in communications and relations with each other. Or to put it slightly otherwise, this shared prosthetic relation to a fundamental identif identificatory repetition engenders the possibility of a response, as Derrida puts it, even as it decisively undermines the distinction between mere mechanistic or instinctive reaction over here and genuine response over here that has anchored the human versus animal difference in the philosophical tradition. And because of that fact, response cannot accomplish the ontological work that the philosophical tradition thinks it does, which would indeed generate the autoimmune disorder that results from the anthro and indeed androcentrism 
but rather pushes it to, to, to even harder to draw out the real specificity of different life forms as those bear upon the question of norms. Moving toward a conclusion, <coughs> last page and a half. What begins to dawn on us at this point then is the full complexity of the engagement with biologistic continuism as articulated by Derrida, which assumes its most challenging and illuminating form, I think, in his reading of Heidegger. Heidegger was right, Derrida argues, to reject the idea of some homogeneous continuity be between what calls itself man and what he calls the animal. And he was also right to insist that the fundamental questions here are, if you like, phenomenological, if not indeed ontological, and in a way that's not wholly reducible to the question of the human. What Heidegger was wrong about was his insistence that whatever is at stake here, phenomenologically, ontologically, ethically, corresponds to a difference in kind, a kind of absolute limit between the human and the animal. Derrida's position, on the other hand, <coughs> will involve, quote, not effacing the limit, but in multiplying its figures, complicating, thickening, delinear delinearizing, folding, and dividing the line, precisely by making it increase and multiply, unquote. Or as Matt Calarco puts it, in offering answers to such questions, it quickly becomes clear that the pre-subjective conditions that give rise to human subjectivity cannot easily be restricted to human beings, unquote. And thus, as he puts it, post-humanism is confronted with the necessity of returning to first philosophy with the task of creating a non-anthropocentric ontology of life-death, unquote. This doesn't mean that whoever is the addressee of ethics or politics or justice, human or non-human, is defined by the transcendence of the biological as a simple diametrical opposite of the phenomenological or of the ontological. <clears throat> the point, rather, is that everything that is ethically relevant that Heidegger wanted to separate from the biological has nothing to do with the human-animal distinction, and indeed, it applies to plenty of non-human beings, the basis of whose standing is also not wholly reducible to the pure facticity of their own bi biological existence. Paradoxically then, <coughs> paradoxically then, the rejection of biologistic continuism, in fact, makes possible a more robust naturalistic account of the processes that give rise to that which cannot be reduced to biology alone. And here, the problems with the headlong rush toward life that we find late in Esposito's Bios come fully into view. The problem is that we end up there with nothing but singularities. And the vast differences between the orangutan, <coughs> the wasp, and the kudzu plant, Derrida actually even calls them abysses, but they're abysses that obtain within the animal kingdom, not just between humans and animals. All those differences fall out because they're all reduced in the end to the same kind of difference. We're now in a better position to appreciate the biopolitical point of Derrida's observation in Eating Well that, quote, the power to ask questions, which is in the end how Heidegger defines the Dasein, may be seen as anterior or before the question of the subject, of the who, for whom, and to whom we are responsible, and to whom and for whom we respond but only to give way to what he calls another possibility that overwhelms the question itself, reinscribes it in the experience of an affirmation or a yes, yes, or an engage. That yes, yes, that answers before even being able to formulate a question, that is responsible without autonomy before and in view of all possible autonomy of the who subject. But why without autonomy? Because the relation to self in this situation, as he puts it, can only be of difference, that is to say, of alterity. Not only is the obligation not lessened in this situation, but on the contrary, it finds in it its only possibility, which is neither subjective nor human, which doesn't mean that it's inhuman or without subject, but that's out of this dislocated affirmation that something like the subject, man, or whoever it might be, can take shape, and that's the phrase I want to emphasize <coughs> here, whoever it might be. Of course, in closing, 
Of course, there are many, many forms of life, plant life, bacterial life, much else, in fact, most of the life on the planet, that fall outside the parameters I've been describing, at least as far as we know at the moment. Indeed, the overwhelming majority uh, of forms of life on the Earth, as I've already noted. But my foregrounding of the who here is meant to remind us that while it's no doubt worthwhile to continually rethink, rethink the relations between different forms of life, whatever they might be, and beyond that, to understand as fully as possible the complex ways in which they're enmeshed, enmeshed and networks, networked with the inorganic world, say in the analysis of Jane Bennett or Bruno Latour, the questions of ethics and law and justice and hospitality, if you want to put it in Derridian terms, pose a specific kind of challenge. <clears throat> Namely, that in a parliament of things, as Latour puts it, or a political ecology of things, as Bennett puts it, some of those things are also who's and not just what's. And, and even, as any who, even as any who becomes one only by virtue of also being a what, that is to say a non-organic entity. Is there not a qualitative difference between the chimpanzee used in biomedical research, the flea on her skin, and the cage she lives in? A and a difference that matters more, one might say, even in Derridian terms, infinitely more to the chimpanzee than it does to the flea or the cage. I think there is. This is not to reinstate <coughs> what's obviously an untenable opposition between persons and things. Indeed, the prosthetic logic of the who and the what that I've been outlining argues exactly the opposite. But it is to put our finger on a specific challenge entailed by thickening and deepening rather than flattening our description of the worlds and networks that we share and their qualitative dimensions. The challenge is summed up well by speculative realist and object-oriented ontologist philosopher Levi Bryant <coughs> Uh, who writes that, quote, the issue isn't one of excluding the human, but of asking how the domain of value might be extended beyond the human without humans being at the center, or all questions of value pertaining to non-humans being questions about the relationship of humans to non-humans. In other words, the litmus test revolves around whether that domain of value would continue to be a domain of value even if humans ceased to exist. This seems to be a pretty tall order, or at least very difficult to think. No, no case could here be made, he continues, that there's something of intrinsic value in non-humans, such as animals or the planets. Rather, we would be committed to the thesis that there are only relative values of some sort or another. The planet, for example, would only take on value predicates in relation to human beings. Were humans not to exist, the planet would neither be valueless or valuable, it would just be, unquote. <clears throat> but as I've been arguing here, it seems to me that there's a third possibility, which is that ethics indeed necessarily depends upon a to whom it matters, but that to whom need not be, and I think we know at this point, cannot only be human. If the capacity to respond is indeed crucial in determining the who, it's also the case that the ontological opposition between responding and reacting, as we already know, is permanently under erasure, because the who is not a given, but rather emerges, is literally brought forth out of a complex and enfolded relation to the what, to the outside of semiosis, archive, technology, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and this means, in turn, that the who, the addressee of ethics and of immunitary protection, is permanently open to the possibility of whoever it might be, Indeed, it seems entirely plausible to me, even likely, that the opening to the question of the who that's occurred over the past few decades with regard to some non-human animal forms of life might well extend in the future into forms of life that we yet scarcely understand, or to put an even finer point on it vis-a-vis -vis synthetic biology that have yet to be invented. And I would add, in fact, as I've suggested elsewhere, <coughs> that there's no reason in principle that the to whom need to be limited to organic or carbon-based life forms alone, a prospect, of course, that sci-fi people have been all over for a long time. Brian is right then, to finish up, Brian is right then <coughs> that were there no to whom, the planet would neither be valueless or valuable, it would just be. But he's wrong to assume that this hinges on whether humans exist. 
Indeed, we can argue that were human beings no longer to inhabit the planet, it would still be of value to those non-human beings who depend upon it, enjoy it, have wants and desires in relation to it, and so on. And from this vantage, the problem with the recourse to life as the ethical sine qua non is that it bespeaks the desire for a non-perspectival ethics, ethics imagined fundamentally as a non-contingent view from nowhere. <clears throat> but of course, as I've been arguing, there is no such view, and even if there were, who would want to live there? Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'm used to like 80% humidity, so. summer vacation. <laughs> we, started, we started a week before you guys, so we're, we're already back in, the, back in the routine. I want to have somebody just going to give me a martini. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Does being a vegan make a difference in being human? And being a vegan. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a, I mean, a little background on this. Where all this work for me came out of was actually, um, when I was a graduate student, I was very involved in the animal rights movement. I was, I was an animal rights activist. And, um, and at that time, you know, there, there, was no, there was no academic discourse really around these issues in, in the humanities. I mean, there was, you know, we had Peter Singer's work and we had Tom Reagan's work and, you know, analytical philosophy, you know, um, devoted to animal rights. But in terms of, you know, people who were reading, you know, Derrida and Foucault and Leotard and Baudrillard and all these people, there was no what you would call kind of state-of-the-art theoretical discourse around this question of the animal and the humanities. Um, and so it took a long time in my own work to figure out how to take concerns such as that and sort of um, rework them and rethink them in terms of the philosophical and theoretical models that, at, you know, at that time were, you know, kind of holding sway in academia. Um, you know, within, within, within sort of animal activist communities, you know, the, the question of veganism, and it's actually one that Derrida talks about in a few places, you know, is a, is a complicated question because it's a balance between, you know, a kind of the demonstrable fact that not eating animals and, or even not partaking of animal products does demonstrably have a lot of positive consequences that you can kind of empirically point to on the one hand. On the other hand, as Derrida points out, that doesn't mean that your life, especially if you live in our society, in a rich, a rich northern bourgeois democracy, doesn't mean your life is, is free of uh, violence with regard to, to the effect on the environment or animals. And so what, what Derrida is trying to draw your attention to on this topic is, yes, it's an important and powerful thing to do, but you always run the risk of kind of being, you know, of, of sort of having a clean conscience that's a little too clean, right, um, in, a, in a way that forgets that, to put it in Lacanian language, that only the non-duped err, you know, only the non-duped um, fool themselves. So, so it's a... You know, in a way it depends, I mean, the, the other way of thinking about this is it depends on what you think ethics is, right? I mean, for somebody like Singer and Reagan, you know, ethics is, and for, and for kind of the analytical tradition, the justice tradition generally, I mean, e ethics is really conceptually and propositionally and argumentatively deriving the nature of the good, right, 
And then you have sort of in your pocket a kind of list of proper ways of achieving the good in your actions that apply, you know, theoretically in all situations. And so and somebody like Singer would say what makes them ethical is that you don't abandon them, right, in the face of the complexities of a particular situation you walk into. My problem with that, and this is where I think a Derridian understanding of ethics is actually empirically describes what people actually do in their ethical behavior, my problem with that idea of ethics is, you know, it unsituates and, and makes abstract all of the people involved in the conversation. So do I have the right as a, as a you know, upper middle class, you know, white member of the professional managerial class called academia, do I have the right to then walk into an intimate community and say to them, well, you know, we've done all this research on, on uh, sea mammals that you guys have been killing for a couple thousand years, and we now know that they lead these complex lives, and we now know that they have emotional bonds with others, and that they're really smart, and they communicate, so you're going to have to stop killing them now, I'm sorry. Right? To put it that way, I think, you know, then leads you back to a different understanding of ethics that, that Derrida wants to emphasize which is the, the thickness and the contingencies related to what he calls the, un, the fundamental undecidability of the pragmatic ethical instance, that those have to be confronted in every decision that you, that you face. So there are two, there are two very different understandings of, of kind of the ethical backdrop against which, against which your question would, you know, would obtain. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, Kerry Wolf's here for to give this lecture, but he's also here, uh, is here also to attend a workshop uh, um, tomorrow and on Friday uh, that is on the concept of the human. Actually, I wanted to reserve this question for the workshop, but I think uh, just also raised right now um, at least part of the questions. Um, the distinction between the human and the animal has, of course, a historical dimension. You have talked about the philosophical dimension. of It has a historical dimension. I think this question arose um, in a, at a very important uh, world historical juncture, that's the discovery of the new world. Uh, when um, the Spanish uh, conquered the new world, the question arose whether those beings that were discovered, so to speak, right. uh, were actually right. Humans uh, and this, the the most important philosopher in 16th century Spain, uh, or the Thomas uh, uh, Tom, uh, legal scholar Francisco Vitoria, made this distinction. Namely, he in a few lectures, in a couple of lectures on lecture on the temperancia, that is on the question of dietary issues, and on other lectures, he. Uh, Draw, dis draw a distinction between human and the animal, and then said the Indians, the natives, uh, were, uh, seemed to be actually humans, and they should be treated as humans. Um, so uh, now uh, I, uh, I refer to Victoria to point out that, this, that the definition of the humans as against the animal always has a historical and a political dimension. Yeah. So now you, uh, could you probably say a few words about you now the, uh, you know, the current uh, political and particularly the historical dimension uh, of these discussions of man and animal uh, distinction. Yeah, um, well, you know, this is, this is one of the reasons I ended up doing this book is it seems to me what's, what's, if nothing else is useful about the biopolitical frame, it makes it clear, and this, this, this would pertain to the, to the historical instance that you're citing, it makes it clear that there's not just one distinction in play here, there are two. There's, hum, there's human versus animal here, but then there's bios versus zoe over here. And those two distinctions are in a relationship of kind of floating transposition, for often quite strategic reasons, sometimes not philosophical reasons at all. The other thing that's useful about it is, that, is I think it helps you draw out uh, the fact that the, the, the Biazoe distinction is a radically ambivalent one, right? So 
you, you, would be, you, know, you kind of jump the gun to say, well, animalization is always, even though it's been a dominant resource and a dominant mechanism for, for subjugating and committing violence against various populations, animals, animalization per se is not always a negative or thanatopolitical mechanism, right? I mean, the, inst the institution, of, the institution of, of pet care, especially in the United States over the past 10 years, is a striking example. I mean, the pet care industry has grown exponentially over the past 20 years in the United States to the point where now there's all kinds of veterinary care, um, EKGs, chemotherapy. I know this because I went through it with one of my own dogs who died of lymphoma. All kinds of, of veterinary care that's, that's literally not available to a large segment of the world's human population, right? So it's not, just, it's not just about the human-animal distinction. It's about the transposition of the human-animal distinction vis-a-vis -vis the bios-zoe distinction, right? And you know I, I, that, that plays out, I think, how that distinction plays out or how that transposition gets mapped is, you know, I think, you know, different at, at, at different historical moments. I mean, the most striking in the, in the book the most striking instance, and it's the one that I sort of spend the most time talking about, uh, is, is the issue of the Holocaust and the extent to which uh, this analogy, if it is one, of, of the animal Holocaust going on now, I mean, this is what Derrida calls it, and other people have called it this, the animal Holocaust going on now, the extent to which that can be or should be analogized to the Holocaust of the Jews in World War II, right? Now, you can fast forward into the post-9-11 context and think about how that gets revisited uh, on a different political side in the post-9-11 context and leads Judith Butler, for example, to do the kind of work that she's doing in precarious life and, and frames of war, right? Which leads her back to rethinking her own relationship to her own Jewishness, essentially, right? So. I think it's true that these are historically specific instances, but I think they're also, in a way, kind of haunted, <laughs> you know, spectralized, <laughs> you know, in, in a way, by their relationship to um, earlier historical instances that constantly threaten to kind of um, reposition themselves, I would say, in relation to the current instance. Um, my main concern in my paper, uh, and I just touched on this briefly, is you know that this this attraction to life, this attraction to a kind of neo vitalist principle, um, especially when it becomes associated with a kind of theological mechanism, you know I think ought to give one pause in the current geopolitical moment, right? Um, even though obviously I understand, you know I understand the attractions of it. The attraction is hey when you start drawing lines between humans and animals or Aryans and Jews, or any in-group and any out-group, it's bound to turn into this autoimmunitary movement. And that's what the main line of biopolitical thought has been scared of, you know, in including Derrida, by the way, in Philosophy in a Time of Terror. So, yeah. Hi, um, this is really very compelling, actually. I have a question. Um, or, well, uh, I'm really a question we're asking you to kind of expand on, on something. Because I, what I really enjoyed about the talk, I like this idea of what you're just talking about, the, the sort of preservation of some idea of life, for example, um, that you see in Esposito and that you see in, in, in a great deal of the neo-vitalist work, that you know, the kind of creation and creativity of life becoming, it's, 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 it's good and it's something that we want to preserve. And that an, affir an affirmative bio That's right, right, exactly. The desire for an affirmative bio Yeah, policy. and I think that's really interesting. But what I want to ask is, um, and also too, um, I'm going to ask you two questions. If you could kind of further talk a bit more about um, this idea of an ethics uh, that now is, I guess, one kind of, I would say, horizontally formed in terms of relations. So the relations not just to, you know, again, to, to, not this subject of who and life, but saving life, preserving life, but in terms of, you know, the relationship, as you said, very eloquently, of the monkey to the cage to the experiment right. and to that. So that sort of 
horizontal relation of, 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 uh, of, um, right. of ethics. But also, too, it, what I think is really interesting, and I don't know if you mean this, but also it, it would seem that there's sort of these mediating technologies, how we relate to these various yes. technologies and instruments. Yes. Because it makes me think of Daniel Pike, who wrote this really great little essay about, you know, ultimately modernity and looking at the Great War. So how is it from the abattoir, the sort of rationalization of slaughter, right. that we then move right to sort of the killing fields of the, of, of the Red Dune and the Somme? Yeah. But so that sort of horizontal mode and the sort of an ethics based on our relations to these technologies of well, of killing, of death. How, I would like, could you talk about a sort of agribusiness, for example? I mean, because there's so many technologies involved. There's a, the kind of speculative technologies of, of, of capital. There's the technologies of the actual machines. And then there's the, and then the, all of the various, well, you know, right. players involved. Right. So right. how would one think of an ethics of, right. of agribusiness in that? In that in that framework, which I, I just I find it compelling and right. Well, one, one, yeah. I mean, this to sort of stitch this together with the previous question. One thing I try to do in the in the book is I actually spend some time on this this um, analogy or whatever you want to call it, and that that would be a potentially endless argument about what you want to call it. But this analogy of sort of the animal holocaust uh, with factory farming, because actually the the lines of relation here are are quite complicated and they break differently politically in terms of how you think about biopolitics. So Henry Ford developed the production methods that were appropriated by the Nazis to carry out the Holocaust. But Henry Ford, who was a notorious anti-Semite, by the way, actually got his idea for his assembly line technologies from visiting the Chicago stockyards and the disassembly lines the dismembered animal carcasses on, on, on the conveyor belt when he, when he was a young man, right? Now, if you think of biopolitics for, uh, in, 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 in terms where sovereignty is constitutive of the biopolitical problematic, none of what I said matters. But if you think about it in the terms that are oriented more toward a sort of Foucauldian orientation that you're voicing toward apparatuses, dispositifs, then all of a sudden, the political status of contemporary confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs or factory farms, changes pretty dramatically. And the lines of relation and how direct those lines are between um, the treatment of the Jews and the other victims of the Nazis in World War II and, and the contemporary factory farms, suddenly those lines of relation politically are very different, right? There's, there's much more, in fact, continuity between them if you understand that, look, the point of biopolitics is not sovereignty. The point of biopolitics is that the body, whatever body it is, human, animal, that's not fundamental to the problematic. The body becomes the direct object and resource of political power, right? If you understand biopolitics that way, you know, then the lines of relation between the Nazi death camps and the contemporary factory farm are pretty direct. So factory farming is no longer this kind of embarrassing sideline over here that we all sort of like, oh, how bad, how embarrassing, that has nothing to do with politics proper. It's actually integral to the, re to re to the reorganization of political activity and political space on a Foucauldian understanding of, of the, mod the specifically modern nature of biopolitics, right? Um, so having said that, having said that, what Rosie Braidotti calls the kind of transversal relations, you know, again, break very differently in ways that you just can't talk about. The, you can't, the human-animal distinction is far too blunt of an instrument to be of any use here. You know, the multiple, the multiple ways in which different beings, human or animal, are configured in these transversal <laughs> relations means that a chimpanzee living in the wilds of Gombe and a chimpanzee who biologically, zoologically, is exactly the same who's being used in biomedical research at a university like this, those are not, those are not cognate <laughs> instances, right? Even as the, the phenomenological and ontological substrate that makes both of those animals different from the cage they live in are important, right? And so try, trying to conjugate both of those factors is part, of what I'm, is part of what I'm trying to do in the book. One more comment about this um, that, that I had to go through really quickly in the talk, but this is a key part of, the, of my argument, is, is to just to kind of flesh out this, this 
this question of the substrate, what I'm arguing is that, look, there are certain creatures who have a constitutively prosthetic relationship to technicity. And, I, and technicity understood as semiosis, archive, you know, um, complex social interactions, culture in the broad sense, et cetera. There are certain creatures who have a constitutively prosthetic and recursive relationship to technicity, which allows their physiological wetware to be literally reconfigured and rewired by that recursive relation that in turn leads them to have these highly variable ontogenies that other creatures don't have, and that matters. And it's on that basis that some creatures are capable of responding and others aren't. It's on that basis that there's a difference between an orangutan and a cockroach, okay? And to me, it's a difference that matters. That's not to say cockroaches never matter, and it's not to say trees and plants never matter. It's to say that they matter, if they matter, they matter in a different way, right? And, 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 on a different, and on a different basis. Now, this is important because it enables you to navigate this problem of biological or biologistic continuism. Right? Because, 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 because that substrate that I'm describing is therefore does not reside and can't be reduced to the physiology, the zoology, the, the, the sheer zoological designation of the creature, but it also can't be reduced to the externality of technicity. Right? It's actually, it, it doesn't reside in either place. It's actually a, it's actually a dynamic. And what I actually argue in the book is I actually go back to um, kind of an offhand comment that Dominico Capra made about animal design. And I, what I actually try to do is I try to sort of rethink the question of, of design's radical, radically ahuman nature um, by sort of stitching together this theoretical argument and some materials from, from zoological um, and, and <coughs> ethological research. So. Yes, hi, stranger. How are you? Good. I'm about to ask you. You're, you're waiting for the microphone. Same question I always ask you, but slightly different. And, and slightly more said, polite this time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no, you've actually already answered it. So, um, but it is to, to follow up on this, dis on this question of recursivity and yeah. how you might distinguish it from more traditional forms of autonomy as the basis for ethical value. Right. Because I was thinking, I mean, the other thing that I always like to point out, right, is, is Michael Pollan's analysis of the factory farm is, in fact, symptomatic of a whole way of doing agriculture such that right. it, you'd have to think about how you're growing plants as much as anything else in order to address yeah. that ethical yeah. question. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you about the status of the working domesticated animal which in the factory farm has in fact been reduced to one particular function, right? right. It's no longer doing anything on the farm, it's right. simply right. producing meat right. or becoming food. And this brought up questions of dependence and interdependence, and so one hesitation I still have is that even if you're shifting from autonomy to recursivity or technicity, there's a way in which there's still room for leaving out the things upon which we might be dependent. Like we wouldn't want to think about the trees and the plants and the air and the water as simply objects in their own right, but as on the contrary, parts of what yeah. we are in dependent relationships to. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. No, 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 I, I, agree, I, agree. I mean, I agree with that. The, the, the thing that I would add, and this goes back to the first question, is like, look, I think it's wrong to kill animals for food. Period. Now, having said that, I immediately have to back up and say, well, who, well who's, who's the me who's saying this, right? I'm in a position to say it and articulate it in a way that ought to take the form of, I think that people who live in our society within a certain demographic description don't need to kill animals for food. And the fact that they do is gratuitous. That's very different from saying nobody in the world anywhere ever should ever kill an animal for food under all conditions, right? So this is, I mean, this is to kind of cut to the chase of, of you know, where we would end up, I think, with, with your question, which is, you know, this, this, this question of, of, of the disposition of animals in factory farms, 
You know, at one point in the book, I just say, I just say, you know, wh why, why don't we just say people stop eating animals? Right? Now, what freaks out Donna Haraway about this is that she thinks that that's a kind of a purist or kind of a clean conscious move, and, and then you throw out the baby with the bathwater because you throw out the relationships of interdependency that are, are, have traditionally been you know, brought back to us in traditional forms of agriculture, at which point I just say to her, you really are a hippie. <laughs> and you've been living in California too long. <laughs> No, 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 seri no, seriously, because she, you know, she thinks that she thinks that, that 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 that's like a viable model that can actually be a model of scale that change changes how people relate to their food. And I don't. I think that's a hippie fantasy land that she's living in, right? Now that's that's not to disagree with her on principle. You know, I mean, there are a lot of reasons I'd love to turn back the clock before modernity ever happened, and that would be one of them, right? Um, but I don't think in terms of, in terms of the, the, the kind of understanding of political effectivity that I was talking about earlier, you know, I don't, I don't, think, that's a, I don't think that's a viable model, you know. Well, you got to have the mic. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, I'm saying on yeah, this yeah. On many Sundays, the church ritual are eating Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they used to use real people. Yeah. And then they started doing great deals. No, you have to read my chapter. You have to read my chapter. My third book, I have a chapter in Animal Rights on the film The Silence of the Lambs that's all about this. It's all about the, the character of Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal the Cannibal, so called. Right? And, and basically, Lecter's function in that film, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a phenomenal, phenomenal film. But Lecter's function in that film is precisely to call out this kind of hypocrisy. Right? Lecter's point is not, oh, I eat animals and therefore I don't eat people. <laughs> Lecter's point is to say, I eat animals and therefore people. Right? So what, Le what Lecter basically does in that film, and it's part of the same structure, is, is to essentially, is essentially call out the hypocrisy of the entire sort of sacrificial regime that makes it okay to kill and eat animals and not okay to kill and eat people. Right? So that, that's what that whole chapter is. I mean, what it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant film and how it handles it. What do you expect when people Jesus? Well, they can eat them. If you believe in transubstantiation or consubstantiation, you're off the hook, <laughs> right? That's Lecter's whole point, you know? Oh, anyway, I'm going to stick in here because I'm going to yeah. have to follow up a yeah. little bit on Annalise's question. One of the... Um, points that I found quite interesting in your talk was the critique of neo-vitalism, which notices that in this redefinition of life as mindful, creative, self-organizing, um, that which looks a lot like autopoiesis Claire and, therefore, and therefore systems yeah. theory, et cetera, right. um, that it's actually that that definition is made in the image of man. Were, right? that's, that's her argument. So you yeah. think you've escaped humanism, but in fact it's right there. Um, and, and, and I understand, so, so first of all, since you've worked so much in, in systems theory and recursivity is such an important yeah. part, yeah. I guess what I don't understand in your answer to Annalise's question is why trees don't have wetware in your terms. That is like, that is the tree um, is constitutively prosthetic as well, right? It requires a certain um, uh, certain uh, environmental conditions to thrive, et cetera. It changes over time, gets sudden oak disease, et cetera. Um, so I don't quite understand how you would differentiate and, and say that type of life is the kind that I think is, is different that matters. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, a, that, that's a very good question. I mean, it, what you have to do here is you have to figure out a way to think about the question of response that doesn't just involve a more, a, a more or less kind of systematic um, kind of you know um, stimulus response, if you might say, model of recursivity. So yeah, pl I mean plants obviously um, change in relation to changing environmental conditions and and make adjustments accordingly. The difference with plants is that they don't exist in a relationship of asynchronicity or difference to themselves because they don't have the relationship to uh, a semiotic system or, or an archive or a set of cultural behaviors that permanently resides out there, right, and which they know can be different 
for them. Right? Now, how to theorize? So far as we know. <laughs> no. Well, actually, there, actually, I've had this conversation with Rich Doyle a bunch of times because he's all interested in like plant intelligence and plant signaling and so on and so forth. Right? But one thing you don't get in plants is you don't get the, the radical rewiring of a biological wetware through this recursive relationship that leads to ontogenies that are so highly variable that the only thing that can hold them together and keep them on the same page in terms of evolutionary advantage is, you guessed it, symbolic behaviors or communication, right? And, th and it's at that level that the recursive loop, it seems to me, is, is I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I would actually say qualitatively different, right? Even though the, the sort of systems theoretical mechanics of it aren't, you know, are in some ways the same. Now, and I'm gonna talk about this tomorrow a little bit in the, or whenever it is tomorrow, yeah, in the thing. Um, but, but the final shoe to drop here is that everything I've just said, and this is where somebody like Lumen is useful, or even Monteron and Varela are useful, everything I've just said then creates a relationship to this recursivity which is constitutively blind because it's self-referential, right? And that's also, it seems to me, something that doesn't, that's not a problem, you might say, um, when we're talking about plants or plants or trees, right? Now, the whoever it might be in my talk is calculated very much to hold open the possibility that we might be wrong about all this. I mean, I, as I, I, I wasn't just, this wasn't just rhetorical posturing when I said at the end of my talk that if you think about how our views of a broad range of non-human animal species have changed dramatically in the past 30 or 40 years, is there any reason to think that it's not gonna continue to change and accelerate in relation to how we understand other forms of life on the planet over the next 30 or 40 years? There's no reason to think that at all. So the, 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 the whoever it may be is, is meant to mark you know, the, po the possibility that this constitutive prosthetic in relation to the exteriority of, of technicity, of semiosis, so on, you know, technicity in the broadest kind of sense, that, you know, we may find out that that obtains, you know, quite differently than we know now to a broad, to, you know, other life forms. And that's fine. Because it doesn't, because if it's not fine, you're just back to racism. If it's not fine, you're just back to saying, these people with this zoological designation in the boat, everybody else out of the boat. And, and, the, and the, point of the, the point of that last part of the paper is it's not about that, right? Heidegger was right to resist biologistic continuism, right? That's the right move, to insist that what matters is design and that being is not a being. You know, Heidegger was right about that. I think Derrida's reading of him is right about that. But he was wrong to insist that that therefore breaks along species lines, right? In fact, what I argue in the book is that Heidegger, Heidegger's uh, characterization of animals having a world in the mode of not having is actually the most accurate designation we're likely to get of design. Because we, we have a world in the mode of not having, right? This is why I said without autonomy at the end of the talk. We have a world in a mode of not having because the very thing that enables us to have a world, to have concepts, to make the world cognizable is precisely outside us. It's not just inorganic, it's dead. It's the technicity, the machinalite of any kind of semiotic system that enables us to enter into that relation. Right? So the irony is that you know, Heidegger's, Heidegger's description of, of animals versus human, it seems to me, is a more accurate description of design you know, re rewritten post Derrida, it seems to me. At least that's what I argue in the book. <coughs> so you've uh, alluded some now to the idea of um, how plants and animals might fit into this, but, and I may be wrong in this, but in your talk, there seemed to be the possibility of science fiction futures also fitting into this. And uh -huh. I we're keep gonna, we're thinking, gonna talk about this tomorrow. I keep thinking about um, some of the feedback loops you're describing as being interlinked with artificial intelligence. So I wonder yeah. if you could yeah. expand a little bit more on the idea of how technology fits in the, into this. Yeah. Right now, it sounds like technology is a tool 
But I think there's also the argument that technology also is an actor. Um, yeah. And yeah. what would it mean to imagine not only these questions of the biopolitical extending into the animal plant right. forms, but also right. extending to technology. No, that, that's a that is a truly heavy duty question, and um, you know I've thought about this a lot and about how different kind of um, sci-fi scenarios have long since played out this question. My one of my favorite one is favorite ones is in. Um, is in Star, Star Trek Next Gen, where Commander Data argues for his right not to be disassembled. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, a, it's a brilliant episode, but it puts precisely this question on the table. And I don't, I don't see any reason, this is, back, this is back to my response to your question, I see no reason that what I'm describing should or could ever be limited to carbon-based life forms. Now, that's not to say that the issue of embodiment isn't really important, right? I mean, I think Kate Hales is right about the kind of the, the Hans Moravec fantasy of downloading your brain. I think she's right about that. So it seems to me that, that the issue here is, is really about modes of embodiment in relation to recursivity, in relation to response, right? But I don't see, I can't think of a single reason to say, well, that's always going to be limited to carbon-based life forms. Um, I mean, can you? I mean, you know, that would be another autoimmune disorder, in, in my view. That would be tantamount to saying, well, we haven't learned from the movement in biopolitical thought, you know, first to saying, well, if you're going to talk about politics, you've got to talk about race, and you can't talk about race without talking about species, right? To draw the line at carbon-based life forms seems to me is, is to forget, you know, what I'm trying to learn from from the biopolitical, or how I'm trying to re retool, you might say, the biopolitical model. I mean, I don't know. Does it, does anybody have a, is, you know, so I th does anybody have a like a, a reason that would like only carbon-based life forms? Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know. Um, but I do think. But I do think then. What's that? I said, what if they're well, I think I think there's every reason to think they they might be. <laughs> I mean, right, <laughs> right. I mean, but um, yeah, I can't think of a reason. Of, of manufacture and creation and, and what kind of hierarchical relationship yeah. might. Yeah, definitely. Then. And that's what Philip K. Dick is interested in in Blade Runner. Um, but I guess my question actually was about biological continuism. And this might be a, a naive question as I haven't read enough about it. But I wondered about the interpenetration of life forms and how one deals with that. That is, yeah. um, you, you mentioned bi bacteria as a sort of a separate Life form, but bacteria, of course, is integral right. to no, human no. body. Yeah, right. yeah, you, exactly. wouldn't, you wouldn't be right, here if you weren't right full down here, of it. Right. Right. So, so how does biological continuism deal with the the, the in unavoidable and vast yeah. and uh, interpenetration of life forms in yeah. a way that we can't really distinguish between ourselves and others? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually in the book, um, I, I I use a few different people to talk about this, but I mean, one of the best I think I think still actually is Bateson. I mean, I, t I talk about, you know, the, 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 the sort of the model that I have found most useful is what Bateson calls his, his redescription of the evolution, evolutionary and adaptive unit as being um, what he calls organism in its flexible environment. It's, a, it's actually a hyphenated, the way I describe it is a hyphenated relationship between organism and environment. Now, that's first order systems theory. The second order systems theory um, way to develop this model a little bit and refine it a little bit more, I think, is what people like Maturana and Varela do, which is to show the relationship between that hyphenated relationship of organism and environment and the recursive self-reference or autopoiesis or closure, right, of particular biological entities. And the way this, I mean, just to cut to the chase, the way this plays out in Maturana and Varela is that there are two main levels. Uh, of, of the autopoetic entity. The, the, there's the level of structure on which 
systems are open and have to be open to energy flows and all kinds of other stuff. And there's the level of organization, which is self-referential and autopoetically closed. So the problem here, I mean, the theoretical problem moving from Bateson to um, second order systems theory is at some point everybody realized oh, well, gee, obviously systems aren't just open and they're not just closed. We have to come up with a model where we can think about systems being simultaneously open and closed, right? Um, and so that's the model, I mean, that's the, if you like, the biological um, model that I'm using uh, in the book. And, and for me, I mean, I don't know enough about the biology to go beyond people like Bates and Amaterana and Varela, but that's where I, that's the, that's the genealogy that I work out of. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll want to thank Carrie Wolf very much, but before thank we you. do, I just want to remind you that tomorrow, as Tank said, there's going to be a beginning a two-day two workshop um, called Fictions of the Human, Thursday and Friday in the Faculty Club. Um, you can see references to it at the Townsend Newsletter. So, thank you. Um, <laughs>